Hi, everybody. Good evening. It is Monday, the 24th of April, 2023. Hope you had a good weekend, a good Monday. We have a lot to talk about today as we talk about what happened today in the Daybell case. Day number 14, that includes jury selection. So really, uh, the days of testimony take away the days that we've lost. I think we're at like day nine or, or something like that. But um, a lot of interesting stuff happening today. We've got FBI agents or analysts on the stand. We've got text messages and emails between Chad, Lori, and Alex. We have visits to the temple while Chad and Lori are still married to their spouses, allegedly. And we have uh, a lot a lot of technical data. Uh, today, the, the jury saw the wedding photos for Chad and Lori's wedding on the beach in Hawaii. Uh, a couple of those photos I don't know if we've seen before, uh, perhaps. We also learned today that um, Lori searched for life insurance for kids. So we'll talk about that. Before we get going, let me know where you're watching from. And if you have any questions, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, we'll start off tonight by talking about Summer Shiflet, Lori's sister, was in court tonight, today, for the first time. She was there with her husband, her uncle, I believe her uncle's wife or daughter, some other relative. She sat with the, def uh, the prosecution. She sat with the prosecution's uh, row in their reserve seating, not with the defense. So that tells us that she's there on behalf of the prosecution. And I expect to see her on the stand as early as tomorrow. Um, if they get through, you know, their witnesses. So Summer Shiflet was there. Um, I didn't see much interaction between her and Lori. I know a lot of you want to know what was the interaction like. So I saw Lori look at her a few times. During one of the recesses, they seemed to be communicating somewhat. But other than that, I didn't see much communication. I did see Jim Archibald, her attorney, introduce himself to Summer. I, I don't think they had met before today. He shook her hand. Uh, and then the, the private investigator who works with uh, Jim Archibald teams and John Thomas, he obviously knew Summer. And so they, they spoke too. But that, that, that was there. Kay and Larry were back in the courthouse today. Uh, with some of their family members as well, and a lot of members of the public. I've met so many amazing people who have come from all over. If you're watching, thank you for introducing yourself to me. Met a couple today from Orem, Utah. Uh, sat next to an Australian. Uh, I've met people from California who have come up, and Idaho, of course, all over the place. So there's a lot, a lot happening. So here's what we have coming up tonight. So many phones. I can't even tell you how many phones because I lost track of how many phones police found associated to Chad and Lori and Alex. I think it was 18, then it was 12, then it was 16. Burner phones too. We'll talk about what that means. We'll talk about what the emails and the texts reveal. I mentioned the visits to the temple. We'll talk about the cell phone tracking and mapping. And we'll talk about what's next in the case. This is moving along. We did see much more cross-examination from the defense today than we have seen in a while. I have some clips I want to play you. And we will remember Tylee, JJ, Charles, and Tammy. Here are the sketches from today. This is Detective Stubbs. He was on the stand. We had three witnesses. Detective Stubbs with RPD. We had Nicole Heidemann. She's with the FBI. And we had Nick Bana, uh, Balany. Balany. Nick Balany. Can't read my writing. They were all on the stand today. He's with the FBI too. But this is a sketch of Stubbs. This is a sketch of the agent or the analyst from the FBI. And then we have a sketch here of Nick uh, Balany. And they showed evidence. You can see the the image behind him. It says CAST Legends. That's when they're – he's with the CAST group with the FBI. That stands for Cellular Analysis Survey Team. And they basically analyze cell phone data and uh, try to track down what was happening. So let me go through real quick, just some preliminary notes that I took today, and then we'll jump into some of the slides that I prepared. Um, one thing, interesting thing that Detective Stubb says is that when he entered Melanie's apartment in Rexburg for the search warrant, Melanie, remember, is Lori's niece who moved up here with her uncle Alex and her aunt Lori. Uh, he found, uh, I believe he said it was a binder or a... Um, storage 
uh, I don't know what you call it, you know, where you store credit cards or coupons or something like that. He found a binder full of credit cards in Melanie's apartment with many belonging to Brandon, her ex-husband. For a Verizon bill, so they got a search warrant to go to a post office box in Sugar City that Lori Vallow had taken out. And there were hundreds of letters in that box. It's like it was never checked. And there was a cell phone bill to Verizon that was associated to 18 phones. That's where that number 18 came from. Uh, at the time, Rexburg police coordinated with the FBI to do what they call a tap and trace. Basically, they search for all of those phones and see if any of them are live, active, and where those phones are. And they were traced to Hawaii, Lori's phone and Tylee's phone. Now, this was back late November of, of 2019. Tylee had been dead at this point for about two months. So the phone that was that was showing that it was in Hawaii, even though it was registered to Tylee, it sadly was not her. Her mom obviously had the phone. So when police, do you remember that day that we went to Hawaii and Chad and Lori were there and they, they seized that rental car and they seized what was inside? Apparently there were 10 devices inside the car. And there was an entire page in a notebook with email addresses and phone numbers tracking all of these phones. I'm gonna get a, a little personal here. I called my wife on the lunch break. I said, honey, I, I can't even like keep track of one phone. I cannot imagine having 18 phones and 10 different devices. Not only that, there were, they had different names for each other, according to the evidence. Like in Lori's phone, Chad was called Bishop, what was it? Shumway. And then in another phone, he was called Bishop Miller. And it, it, was, it was just all, all sorts of names in these different phones. And, and we had heard about this um, early on. Uh, about all these phones, but it was just crazy, you know, to hear about it all. And how do you remember all those phone numbers? I don't know, but what the, what the FBI did and what the police did is they basically pulled all the phones and then they focused in on the phones of uh, that were the most prominent or the most used, you could say. Okay, so I'm going to show you. Now, this is this what they so so they seized the phones and then what they did is is. Uh, they did a search on September 8th and 9th. Okay, I hope you can see this. I'm going to uh, try to give you a laser pointer here. This is Chad's house. Do you see where this little uh, red dot is moving? This is Lori's apartment. What they did is they took a 250 meter radius, which is about the size of two and a half football fields, from what I'm told. And they basically did a circle around each of these two homes, Chad's and Lori's. And they searched to see if any devices on September 8th and 9th and September 22nd and 23rd were found in both of these zones, you could say. Any devices. And there was one. And it was Alex Cox. So Alex Cox's phone was found in both of these bubbles around Lori's house, Chad's house, on October 8th and 9th, 22nd and 23rd. Those are the dates that police say JJ and Tylee were killed. So that narrows things down a lot. When there's one phone, one person that's been in both of those bubbles, those nights, and it's Alex Cox. Then we heard about burner phones. Now, do you know what a burner phone is? A burner phone, according to the detective, Stubbs, is drug dealers use them a lot. But they're those phones you go down to 7-Eleven or Walmart, pick them up, you pay up front, cash up front, you buy X amount of minutes or whatever, and then you can quickly dispose of them when you're done with them. Chad and Lori and Alex had a lot of uh, burner phones. But what they did on these burner phones, according to the detective, is they would log into their Gmail accounts. The Gmail accounts associated Homer J. Maximus. That was Alex's. Lori for Style was Lori's. Lolly Time Forever was Lori's. Chad Daybell. Well, you know, that's Chad. These are Gmail accounts. So even if you... <coughs> Excuse me. 
even if you have a burner phone, one moment, even if you have a burner phone and you log into your accounts, even if you don't log into your accounts, but you somehow are able to use some of your personal information, they're able to be tracked. And the way that Detective Stubbs described it is the self, the, the uh, companies like Google, Facebook, maybe Yahoo, they create a web of your activity. So for instance, I'm in a hotel. I've got two computers in front of me. I've got a cell phone right here. I log into one, my Gmail over here. I log into my other, my Gmail here. I log into my phone, my Gmail. I have them all, I have them all here. My Facebook accounts, my YouTube accounts, whatever. I'm in Boise. And, and they're able to connect all of these devices and see that. That's why if you've ever gotten those alerts, like some unusual activity has been spotted on your account. Someone from Russia tried to log in or something like that. It marks it as unusual. So um, they create a web of all of the devices. And they were able to do that with some of these burner phones. Because, again, Chad and Lori were logging into their Gmail accounts. So even though they thought that maybe some of the evidence might not be there on these burner phones. It actually is. And frankly, these devices store more than we'll ever know every single movement. And they can be recovered. Okay, so that's that's the talk about the burner phones. Now, um, we I mentioned the uh, wedding pictures that were shown. Her wedding dress in Hawaii, Lori had looked that up. She looked up signs of a Malachite ring. She had looked up possessed. We're going to get into that in a minute, some, what some of these searches were that were found on these phones. Uh, but I do want to play a bit from John Thomas, the defense attorney. So John Thomas uh, cross-examined after Detective Stubbs spent about an hour this morning on the stand. Remember, he also spent Friday afternoon on the stand and played that body camera footage. He played that uh, um, the time that he went over and they did the search warrant with Lori and she wasn't there and he walked us through the house. So he's been on the stand for, you know, almost a full day now combined between the two days and he talked about all sorts of stuff. I mean, just so much stuff here. But he talked a lot about the emails and what was found and the evidence and whatnot. But here is how John Thomas cross-examined him. So this is how it works. If you haven't been in a courtroom, this is the prosecution's case. They are calling all of their witnesses right now. They go on the stand. The prosecution questions first. When they're done, the defense has a chance to cross-examine, try to poke holes in the person's testimony or clarify. Most of the cross-examination this, for this trial thus far has been clarification questions. You said this, you know, help me understand this. They'll call them out occasionally on some things. The prosecution can then readdress the, can then readdress the, uh, the witness one more time because, again, it's their case. So sometimes it can go back and forth. Um, so this is what happened when John Thomas cross-examined Stubbs today. This is one of the one of the th issues he brought up. You indicated that you had reviewed some some uh, data from Lolly Time Forever at gmail.com and a whole, whole bunch of others. In any of that, anything from Lori saying let's kill the kids? No. Did you ever see anything that see anything from Lori saying let's kill the kids? Stand by, stand by. No. We're only you getting Stubbs' said, response. Will you kill my We're kids? Getting John Thomas. No. Let me pull it up in another program and I'll see if I can play it for you. Um, I don't know why it does that. But uh, anyway, uh, what, what John Thomas basically said to him was, in all of your search for evidence, in all of these texts, in all of these emails, in everything you're, you pulled up, did you find any messages that say i want to kill the children and john and uh, stubb said no did you find any evidence that lori said i i want um the children should die no did you find any evidence please arrange for the children to die no and so john thomas kind of pinned him down on those uh, issues and said, that's not what, uh, that's not what was said there. So, um, just one minute. Stuff, Louisiana. That's okay. 
I may not have it because for some reason the audio the the court um, when they sent over the audio this afternoon this evening, we only got the um, we didn't get the first few minutes. You indicated so, that you for this to testifying as to I, I will find that bite and I will post it and you can go to our East Idaho News uh, page when we're done here and you can listen to exactly the questioning. Coming and we'll stay for. Okay, so we'll move on from there. My apologies for not having that. It was a pretty interesting exchange. It was about a minute or so, but uh, the, the prosecution or the defense did come out. Now, after after Stubbs left the stand, Nicole Heideman took the stand. She works with the FBI, and she talked about more email stuff and more uh, text message stuff. And she did a search on Chad's email and Lori's email. And they, she basically analyzed their email accounts to see, look for interesting stuff that might be per pertinent to the case. And this is what she found. Some of the searches. Um, okay, on the 31st of January, 2019, I, I need to say really quick, you, we cannot say for certain that this was exactly Chad Daybell, but it was whoever used his account on this day. So... If I'm logged into my account at my house and my kid goes in and searches for something, then it's not me. So they, they made it very clear that this was devices or Chad Day Bell's account that searched for these things because they can't say for 100% certain that it's Chad. I hope that makes sense. But on the 31st of January, 2019, there was a search done for Ned Schneider, Louisiana, obituary, 1997. Somebody look that up and find out if anything comes up. Because that's the name they gave Charles around that time. Uh, they said that he was Ned Schneider. He was possessed of an evil spirit. But it wasn't 1997. So that's the interesting thing. Did Chad come up with that name doing a search? And Sen said to, his, to Lori, his girlfriend at the time, that he was possessed? I don't know. March 3rd of 2019, there was a search. June 26, star sign. Are Cancer and Leo compatible? May 4th sign, Taurus and Leo compatible. On May 5th, Malachite, eBay Malachite jewelry. On June 1st, Hiplos. That was the name of the evil spirit that they said possessed Charles. On July 9th, when you surprise someone with accusations, that is the day Charles died. On the 28th of uh, September. SSS wind. What is the definition of SSS wind? The south southwest wind. And then on October, the the graphics in the way. October. I, I don't see the exact date. It says Rhode Island area code. And they went on to explain that Chad later texted Lori and said, "I'm going to text you from a Rhode Island number." Okay, so those were Chad Daybell's searches. What about Lori's? On this again, these are searches associated to her accounts. Not a hundred percent certain that it's hers, but she had the two accounts: the Lolly Time Forever and the Style, or the Lolly Time and the uh, Lori for Style. Lolly Time Forever and the Lori for Style. She did a search on the seventh of May for Malachite. This is the first time on July 21st that we've seen she searched the Gerber Life Insurance Policy, Life Insurance for Children, the Grow Up Plan. We did not know before today, at least I didn't know, and I've never reported and haven't seen it anywhere, that Lori actually searched for life insurance for her children. This was uh, two months before they died. Um, and as far as we know, according to the detective or the analyst on the stand, she never enrolled her kids in a life insurance policy. Five days later, she searched for the Phoenix Pet Service Craigslist, Cell Service Dog, Little Angel Service Dog, Service Dogs for Sale Offerings Phoenix. This was in regards to JJ's Service Dog. You may remember that she sold. On the 25th of August, she searched for wedding bands made of malachite. On the 20th of September, Kennedy Elementary School, Rexburg, Idaho, phone number, and then define possess. JJ died two days later, two to three days later, and she was searching on the 20th 
the, for the phone number of the school. Then on the 24th, after police say he was dead, she searched again for the elementary school phone number in Rexburg, Idaho. All of that was on there. But that's not it. On September 30th, she searched how to get back seat out of my Jeep Wrangler. Jeep Wrangler JK rear seat removal, how to DIY YouTube. Let me pause there. There is a chance Alex Cox performed that search. As I said, we don't know who was actually using the account, uh, but somebody was logged into Lori's account and did that search. So it could have been Lori, could have been Alex, could have been Chad, could have been anyone that had access to it. But we do know that that's around the time and the storage unit video that I showed you back in 2020 showed, we believe Alex wheeling in that wheel, that tire from the back part of the Jeep. You know how the Jeeps have tires? Putting it in the storage unit and then and then carrying in a heavy seat, putting it in there. And then the next day he comes back and that the seat's taken back out and the tire's taken back out. So somewhere they must have, must have got an answer on how to take off the tire and remove the seat. On the 2nd of October, Gilbert, Arizona News. This was when Brandon was being shot at, remember? And around the time the Jeep, Wrangler, tire, and everything was being removed. And then on the 22nd, three days after Tammy dies, wedding dresses and wedding dresses in Kauai. So... They had all that associated to their accounts. I mentioned Bishop Shumway and Bishop Miller on some of her phones. They had that. Uh, Lori had that as a name for Chad. And then on her Lori for Style account, she had searched seven archangels and presiding council of archangels. She tried to order Malachite rings a few times, but the first time... The vendor was not able to fulfill the order. The second time, her credit card was declined. The third time, she ordered it through Amazon and sent it to the Rexburg address, and it was around $808. She got the rings, a female ring, or I shouldn't say a female and a male. I should say a size. I think it was 4.5 and an 11.5, 11 and a half. It was too big, sent it back, ordered the 11. That was still too big, sent it back, ordered the 10. Um, and then the four and a half she kept and then they they talked about those rings and then they showed the wedding photos i'm sure y'all have seen it where their hands are together and you see the rings actually i'll show you if you haven't seen it um and and it showed they showed the photos of chad and Lori on the beach malachite ring photo okay i'm going to show you this image and here we go. Let me pull it up here on the screen. Right here. So this isn't the, the photo that they showed in court today. I'll zoom in a bit. But you can see one of the rings there on Lori's finger. And uh, you don't see Chad's. But the photo that we saw in court today was actually... We saw both of their hands wearing the Malachite rings. So um, that's that's what happened with the rings. We now know that you know those rings were bought, or actually we know for a while, through Charles Vallow's Amazon account and sent to the Rexburg address. Okay, so there is a text exchange I want to have read for you. And please cross your fingers that this, you can hear both people talking here. Uh, this is about three minutes, and this is Lindsay Blake, the prosecutor from Fremont, asking Nicole Heidemann to read a text exchange. And she's going to give you the details. This is between Chad and Lori, and Lori and Chad talks about a lot of kisses, talks about going to see a movie, it talks about graduation, and some other stuff. Uh, again, it's about three minutes, but I, I found it pretty interesting. I wanted you to hear it rather than have me summarize. Did you also look at some uh, a text message that had been sent i did and uh, looking at the slide is that one of the text messages that you'd focused in on yes and i say text but it says sms message is that correct yes uh could you determine most likely who that message was sent from and to whom 
Again, based on phone attribution, we believe the 515 Bobby number to be uh, attributed to Chad. And who would the message have been sent to most likely? Uh, it would, this was in the Lori or the Lolly Time account, so to Lori Fellow. And what was the date of that message? Uh, July 13th, 2019. Did anything stick out to you about that date? This would have been two days after the death of Charles Vallow. And could you read into the record the content of that text or that SMS message? Yes. Concerning the two weeks, BYU Idaho's graduation is July 23rd. Adam is getting his bachelor's and Leah and Joe are getting their associates. They are all walking in the same commencement ceremony. I feel she will be gone by then, but I will still have the hoop, that hoopla to deal with because a lot of my and Adam's family are coming and will stay for July 24th. So I believe that's why the Lord hinted I might not get to be with you until that is over. Please ask about that. The individuals mentioned in that message, do you know who they are? Yes, Adam and Joe are Chad Daybell's son, sons-in-law and Leah is his daughter. And there's some um, writing there at the bottom of the screen. Were those things that stood out to you about the text? Yes. Did you also review some texts between Chad and Lori um, from July 22nd of 2019? I did. And on this slide, uh, you have regarding Kwai and the plan. When you're referencing the plan, was this in relation to a specific plan? It appears to, with the totality of everything, to be the plan to uh, be in Hawaii together. And to ultimately be together? Correct. And in looking at that text exchange, could you indicate who the text originates from and to whom, or who we believe that it originates from and to whom, and the content of the message? Yes. Similarly to the prior text, uh, it, it, the iCloud shows that it originated, or it, in this situation, a to from situation from the 515 Bubby number uh, previously attributed to Chad to Lori. And what is the content of that first message? Love you, going with Garth in an hour to see other side of heaven too. Missing you desperately, but so excited to be with you. And is there a response from Lori? Yes, Lori responded, you will love it. And then the next message? Uh, the 515 Bubby number responds, not as much as I love you. And does Lori respond to that? She does. Uh, she says, I love you. You will enjoy the scenery. It looks like Kauai a lot. And is there another message then from Lori? Hopefully we will be there someday soon together. And what is uh, the number associated with Chad's response? That is the plan and my greatest desire. Okay, so Tammy was still alive. Chad's kids were graduating from BYU, Idaho. And he's saying, I'm hoping she'll be gone by such and such a date, but there'll be a bunch of hoopla associated with graduation. So I don't know if you can be with me at that point. And then he says, I'm going to go see the other side of heaven part two with his son. Um, so we heard that. Now, I was getting some messages from my wonderful colleague, Elena, who told me that apparently you, you might be able to hear the questioning from the defense. It might just be my earpiece that's only getting one channel. So I want to go back and play that clip. Sorry, I'm, I'm jumping back a little bit. Um, but, but it does still tie in because it was the defense asking the first witness, Stubbs, did you have any definite proof, evidence, text message evidence for everybody to see that Lori said the kids need to be killed. So I'm going to play that. Please let me know if you can hear it, if you can hear the defense attorney talking rather than just silence. Here we go. You indicated that you had reviewed some, some uh, data from Lolly Time Forever at gmail.com and a whole, whole bunch of others. In any of that review of any of, those, any of that data, did you ever see anything from Lori saying, let's kill the kids? No. Did you ever see anything that said, will you kill my kids? No. Anything that said, let's kill the kids? No. Anything remotely 
akin to any of that? Object has been asked and answered. Overruled. Anything akin to any of that? For this account, no. Any of the accounts? I wouldn't know on some of the other accounts because I didn't review those. Okay, but you were part of the team that reviewed them, right? Right. Judge, I'm, I'm going to object, ask and answer, and other officers are going to be in testifying as to the findings on those other accounts. I'll overrule the objection. So based on anything that you've seen, is there anything in there where Lori had texted or emailed or uh, any type of data that says anything about wanting to kill her children? No. Thank you. Nothing further. Okay. So that's probably the most pointed that I've heard the defense get with any witness so far. And it was memorable. I don't know how the jury, you know, took it in, but, you know, it's a key point there that there wasn't any flat out, yes, we need to kill the kids. Not that you need that. I'm not saying that, but it, there wasn't any of that. Um, okay, I want to touch on one final thing and then we, we'll take your questions. I know there's a lot coming in. And I'm so glad you could hear that. It must be my, my earpiece. So I better get a new earpiece because um, all along I've been thinking, oh, no, you're not hearing it when you really are. So that's great. The temple visits. Okay, so um, I got I got a lot of emails today because I, you know, if you follow me, I post updates about every minute or so from the courtroom as the trial is happening, and I tweet them. And yes, I have a lot of typos, but uh, I still want to get the information out to you. They talked today about visits to the temple that Lori and Chad made while they were married. Here were the visits, November 16th, 2018. And then there were visits in 2019, April 3rd, April 27th, September 7th, September 17th, September 28th, October 29th. Now, technically on the 29th, Tammy Daybell had passed away by then. She'd been dead for 10 days. They visited the Idaho Falls Temple, the Rexburg Temple, a temple in Texas, and a temple in Arizona. I, I believe it was the Chandler Temple. I don't know if there's a temple in Chandler, but it could have been the Phoenix Temple. Uh, either way, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven visits in, in that amount of time together. So how did the detectives know this? Well, when you go to the temple, it, it, we're talking about LDS Temple, a lot of times called Mormon temples, but the Latter-day Saint temples. When you go, you show a card a recommend card and they scan it at the desk and they can track everyone who comes in and you have to have that card that you get from your leaders at church and you have to be living certain standards to get one of the cards. You have to be paying your tithing 10% of your income. You have to be living the health code, no alcohol, no smoking, no coffee. You have to, there's several questions that are asked. Then you get the card. You go to the temple. They scan it in. If you go with your spouse or a friend or whomever, they know the timestamps when you scan that card in. The uh, FBI person on the stand said that on these particular dates, every time Lori and Chad's temple recommend cards were scanned within seconds of each other, except once. Chad arrived 20 minutes late. I don't remember which visit that was. Well, the defense made an interesting point and said, well, did you check who, if other people were with them? Like, did they come as a group with other adults and all of them went in? Valid point. The FBI said, no, we didn't check on that. We just checked on the, we were just focused on these two. So what's the big deal? I know a lot of you are emailing like, what's the big deal? Like, who cares if they went together? Well, one who is active in the LDS faith would not go to a temple with a nut, with someone else who's married to someone else. You, you generally would go with your spouse. Now, if you're single, you could go with a date or somebody, but it's, it's, it's more of a, um, a lot of people will go to the temple like for a date night or something to worship together. So if your spouses are still alive, it's very, very unlikely that you would go with someone else who's married to someone else. I hope that explains it. It's not like church. You know, if you go to church, 
I mean, it's kind of like church, but if you go to church, you could show up with whoever, sit with whoever. It's more informal. Anyone's welcome at the church, but at the temple, you have to have that recommend. And one of the questions you are asked is basically, are you faithful to your spouse? And if you say no, that recommend card is going to be taken from you, yanked away. Lori and Chad obviously had spouses that were still alive during much of the many of these visits. And so they, um, you know, were not living within the standards. So that that is the deal with the temple, the temple visits. Will that make an impact on the jury? I, I'm not sure, but um, it, do, it does kind of paint the pictures of their activities. There was about four and a half more hours <laughs> of testimony related to very technical stuff. GPS pings showing Alex in Chad's yard at certain spots, the fire pit, the tree. Uh, Nick Banali, the Balani, the FBI analyst, talked about how they did a drive test. They went out to Rexburg after the bodies were found to see where cell phones would ping off of which towers and how your cell phone will always try to get the strongest signal from whatever tower it can. It might not necessarily be the closest tower, which I found interesting. If you've got a tower here, but the tower over here is stronger and your cell phone can reach it, it's going to go with this one. And he talked about that, where where the uh, cell phones were pinging the nights in question, how uh, Ch- uh, Alex Alex's phone often pinged at Lori's phone late at night, uh, a handful of times, but on the night that uh, they believe Tylee died, it was very active between 1 and 5 a.m. It was a 101-page report that this detective put together, or this analyst put together. Uh, and it uh, they summarized it down to a PowerPoint, and they talked about on September 9th, the morning of September 9th, there was a lot of communication between Chad and Alex and separate communication between Lori and Chad. And that's where we're going to pick it up tomorrow. He will be back on the stand this FBI agent that analyzed all of the cell phone data, all of the pinging, all of the locations. He takes the stand tomorrow. As I said, Summer Shiflet's in town. I expect to see her on the stand possibly as early as tomorrow. Uh, There will be other witnesses, I've learned, who will be coming from out of Idaho this week. And there's still a bunch of detectives, including some um, retired Rexburg detectives who I saw here today. So I assume they will take the stand. So there's our recap for day 14. Before we get to your questions, I have to show you this little cute picture of JJ along with a memory that somebody sent me. JJ loved Snapchat filters, especially the ones with silly faces and voices. It was so much fun to watch him making silly faces at himself while playing on them. You are so loved, JJ. I think anybody with a kid can relate to this. I have kids and they love the filters. Love the filters. They'd be on them all day long if they could. But tonight, let's remember JJ and Tylee and Charles and Tammy. And um, it, is, it is just wonderful to, to have them here and to remember them. Okay, let me go ahead and answer some of your questions. There's a lot here. Thank you for sending them in. And here we go. First question. Nate, I'm hearing you have been called as a witness. Is this true? Me? (laughs) No. Uh, Wait. Yes, I'm not. I am not being called as a witness. Uh, If I was being called as a witness, I could not be in the courtroom every day. So I'm not being called as a witness. I understand that someone posted that somewhere today. And I had several people message me asking me this. I'm not being called as a witness. There, There may be some confusion that... Early on, John Pryor, Chad's attorney, subpoenaed me, and we fought the subpoena, and it was dropped. He wanted information about, I don't even remember what he wanted, but we fought the subpoena, and it was dropped. I'm not being a, called as a witness, and I would fight fight it, because honestly, if I was called as a witness, I couldn't cover this, and I couldn't report to you every night. So no, I'm not on the witness list. Brandon, help me understand how they are getting death dates on the kids. Well, Brandon, I hope that what I've been, what I explained tonight kind of points that out. I mean, it's really a bunch of different 
things, the fact that they were the kids were last seen at Yellowstone, the fact of the money being moved around, the text messages back and forth, the cell phone pings out at Chad's property on certain dates. Um, I'm sure the medical examiner will have something to do with it. We should hear from him very soon. So that that's kind of how they're doing it. It wasn't just like one big smoking gun that they're like, aha, we know that they were killed on this date. And you will notice that they're not, they've never specifically said one date, September 9th. It's been September 8th slash 9th, September 22nd slash 23rd, sometime in that. And they tracked the cell phones of Alex moving around. The last time JJ was saw by, seen by Melanie Gibb and David Warwick. So that it's, it's a bunch of different things that they're kind of compiling all into one. That would be a great story, though, when all this is over. Maybe I'll write something about how exactly did they determine it? How did all the clues come together to get there? I've heard that Chad started a GoFundMe. Is this rumor true? I have not heard that rumor. There was a GoFundMe in the beginning that someone started saying it was for Lori, but um, it wasn't true. It was a it was a f- not a legit GoFundMe, and they took it down. I I don't know if Chad started a GoFundMe. Chad's attorneys in court every day, modifying uh, you know paying attention to this so i'll ask him tomorrow but i haven't heard that can the jury ask a question what if they need clarification especially like scripture that is a good question megan i i believe they have been told to hold all questions until the end and then they can ask the judge questions but they're not to discuss it with anybody today one of the jurors was not feeling well so we had to take a break early on in the day and she met motion to the bailiff but um i think part of it is you just kind of have to uh, go into it and kind of, I I don't want to say blindly, but you are going in blindly as a juror to just, they hope that you have a completely clean slate and they don't, they hope that you just kind of learn as it goes. And so they might have a question about a scripture or anything. There have been, there has been some terminology that people would probably be very confused about. And the prosecution has tried to really clarify it. Um, Okay, how much longer is this going to go? Good question, Leslie. I think I say good question a lot because you guys all have great questions. Um, I think maybe two to three more weeks and we'll have a verdict. Maybe sooner. It all depends. Uh, I, I would say by mid-May, we've got, we've got to have a verdict. I said this before. It has to be over by Memorial Day. It's my parents' anniversary. They're taking... All the kids, all their kids, and our spouses on a cruise. And no no little kids, just the adults. We've never done something like this before. So it has to be over by Memorial Day, or I'm going to have one of you come and cover for me. If you want to come, let me know. No, it'll be done by Memorial Day. Okay, Sue says, Nate, do you think they'll ever look into Joseph Ryan's death? They should. That, you know, a lot of people have asked that. Um, he was cremated, so I don't know what what more they can do. But we do know that we learned also that Lori got $60,000 in life insurance after Joseph died. And then Tylee was able to get money because he was her biological dad uh, after he died. And so she was getting money from that. But I I don't know that that would be fascinating if they open that up. Paula asks, did Lori, Alex and Melanie, did their apartment sell? If so, I wonder if the buyers were aware if Lori, Alex, and Melanie lived there. I wonder what they think or how they feel about their address being known by so many people. Yeah, that's one of the predicaments when you have a prominent crime that happens. I do believe that the apartment, I don't know if it's sold, but I believe there's renters in there. The last time I stopped by, there was decorations on the doors of each of them. So it's, you know, it's a transient town in Rexburg. And believe it or not, some people are not following this story. A lot of people aren't. I'm surprised sometimes. Now, I'm sure once they move in, they might hear about it or someone might tell them. But, um, yeah, I don't know if, if that's there. Uh, did Tammy believe what Chad wrote about and all of his teachings? Why didn't she go with him to the conferences where he spoke and sold his books? If Chad was such a leader, why didn't he include his wife? I understand that she went to a few of the conferences, but it really wasn't her thing or Chad kind of didn't want her along, I guess you could say. He also told people that she wouldn't understand that he was more spiritually in tune than she was, I guess you could say. 
And, you know, it may have been, she may have looked at it as, oh, it, it's just his thing. You know, he goes and sells books. That's his business. He does his thing. I, I do mine. She was huge into genealogy and working on her computer. And, you know, maybe she did that and he did his thing. Um, but, yeah, it, it's a curious question. Why does the judge refer to Lori as Lori Vallow when he starts each day and not Lori Daybell if she's married to Chad? I have heard her called Lori Vallow Daybell, but not by the judge. Interesting question, Tina. When the all of this was filed in the very beginning, the first time they ever put Lori Daybell's name in the Idaho court system, it went in as Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. I think there was some uncertainty at the time whether they were legally married. I don't know if the authorities knew. I know we were questioning it at East Idaho News because we had heard they were together, but we didn't know if they were legally married. And it took some time to actually track down the marriage certificate in Hawaii because it, it's not a public record. Uh, I, and then we finally got a hold of it and saw it, that they had signed it. So, And then her attorney at the time, Mark Means, requested that she be called Lori Daybell, I think the judge just says Lori Vallow because that's what it went in as as the uh, on the court of record. Um, I'll have to pay attention, though, because I'm pretty sure he's called her Miss Daybell. But I think you're right that most times he says Miss Vallow. Are we the people buying Lori's clothes? Deborah asked. I touched on this last night, Deborah. No. Well, I guess if her defense buys him, technically we're paying for her defense attorneys. But from what I understand, the defense and Lori's family members have purchased the clothing. Do you think Chad and Lori paid their 10% tithing to the LDS church on the inheritance money? Marcy asks. I don't know. That would be interesting. I do know as far as food is involved, Lori told many people she no longer needed to eat food or wear her temple garments because she was living a higher law, a higher spiritual law. And so maybe they would have justified not paying the tithing by saying, well, we're living a higher law anyway. And, and if you think about it, we've learned that Chad was kind of creating this new church, the Church of the Firstborn, and, and giving, these patriarch, giving the patriarchal blessing to Alex with the Church of the Firstborn, not any mention of the LDS church. So I, 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 I would strongly doubt if they paid their tithing. I don't even know how often they were going to church. Michelle, do you know if Colby has a relationship with Larry and Kay? Uh, every time I've seen, well, every time I've seen them together, it's they're very cordial and polite. Larry and Kay are, are very polite. And um, I, I mean, he was here last week to testify, but he was in and out. So I don't even know if they spoke much. I do know that when he was here at a hearing last year, they all came out uh at the courthouse in Fremont County and gave, did an interview with me, Colby and then Larry, uh, Larry and Kay. So I, 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 they're on, they're on good terms from everything. From what I understand, do you know if Lori is convicted on all charges in Idaho and Arizona, how would sentencing and serving her time play out? That is the million dollar question. I don't know if anyone knows that because Arizona has said they're going to yield to Idaho and, and deal with her charges in Arizona. Once her Idaho charges get taken care of, there's a few scenarios. She's found not guilty here. Boom, she goes to Arizona and there's a trial. She's found guilty here. Arizona could still say, okay, send her over. We're still going to prosecute her. And then when she's sentenced there, I don't know who determines where she serves her time, assuming it's like a life sentence on each. Or if it's 10 years in Arizona and 20 years in Idaho, she does 10 in Arizona, 20 here. Or Arizona could say, if she's sentenced to life here in Idaho without any parole, maybe they say, we're going to yield to the Idaho sentence because she's not going anywhere. We're going to save money and get it done. Now, Charles Vallow's family might have something to say like, no, he deserves a trial. We want it to happen. So I don't know that that will all play out once once we have a verdict here and a sentencing here, then we'll know more. If she gets sentenced life in prison in Idaho and possibly the death penalty in Arizona, how would this actually work? Well, if she gets life here and the death penalty there, then I imagine the death penalty would take precedent and they'd probably transfer her to Arizona where she would face the, the, death, the death chair. And do you plan to cover the case of the four murdered college kids? A lot of you have asked me that, and I, I'm honored that you would ask me that. The 
town, the University of Idaho is about nine hours from Idaho Falls where I live and work. I mean, it's not even eastern Idaho. It's, 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 it's northwestern Idaho. Even from Boise, it's about four hours north. So it's a distance. Um, I, 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 have done a, I, di- I haven't done anything with it so far other than watch the coverage, and there's a lot of really good reporters on it. But I have wondered and thought about if maybe on that case, I do a courtroom insider like this every night. I don't know if you all would be interested in that, and I understand if you wouldn't be, but maybe we could you know, talk like this every night and break it down. Whether I go to the trial, if it's televised, I could watch it remote. But if there's an actual trial, it would be fascinating to go. In fact, they could very well move it to Ada County, to the very courtroom we're in right now with Lori Daybell. And that would be something. And that would, that would be easier as far as logistically to cover. But uh, I appreciate your compliments and asking me to cover that. We'll see what happens. Last question. Who is Serena Sharp? Her name was mentioned in court two days ago. I'm confused. Kylie asks that. Serena was part of the uh, group that was um, associated with Chad and Lori. She was, she was there with, with some of the gatherings. Um, I don't know if she's on the witness list or not. We'll see. All right. I think we got through. We didn't get through them all, but we got through enough. I hope that that's, that's good enough for you. Uh, I can't thank you enough for watching. We'll be back tomorrow. Again, we have the uh, FBI special agent who's back on the stand. We'll likely hear from Summer Shiflet, Lori's sister, as early as tomorrow. We'll also uh, hear maybe from the medical examiner this week. Uh, there could be some real compelling, interesting, heavy testimony coming out this week. And if Summer Shiflet does take the stand tomorrow or the next day, it, I'm, I'm pretty certain they will play that phone call that I've talked about between Lori and Summer. Uh, that is, it is um, something. It is, it's gut-wrenching. And then we'll be able to play it for you. Uh, here on Courtroom Insider. Don't forget to follow me. There's my Facebook. There's my Twitter. There is my Instagram. I just got a shout out. Justin Lum's watching from Arizona. I miss him in my in the courtroom. We were sitting by each other every day. Then he's like, oh, I'm going where it's warm. And then the weather turned, so it's been it's been cold. But yeah, he's coming back. Don't worry. And East Idaho News uh, YouTube, we've got all the audio clips on there. In fact, the minute I get off this every night, I go and I upload the rest of the audio. So um, I'm going to upload those tonight. Feel free to follow those. My Instagram, not, not very many things work-related, but I do have some family stuff on there if you want to watch that. I appreciate you all watching. We'll be back tomorrow, and you can follow eastidahonews.com all day tomorrow as I uh, bring you the latest minute by minute. All right. Have a good night.